Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Fred McMurray in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the story about a man who dreamed of someday having all the money he would ever need and one day found a way to make his dream come true. The Great Train Robbery. Our star, Mr. Fred McMurray. Well, Harlow, the team is all set for the season. Always half that great Autolite electrical system in your car is designed as a team and works as a team. That's because every unit, like the coil, distributor, spark plugs, battery, generator, and starting motor, are all related by Autolite engineering design and manufacturing skill to give you the smoothest performance money can buy. Harlow, I mean our ball team. And the electrical system really has to be on the ball. It goes into action the instant you press the starter, and it continues every second the engine runs. And it works every time you blow the horn or turn on lights, radio heater, or electric windshield wiper. Harlow, I know it's important. It sure is, Hap, and that's why it pays to treat the electrical system of your car to a periodic checkup. See your car dealer or your authorized Autolite service station. You can quickly locate your nearest authorized Autolite service station in the classified section of your phone book under Automobile Electrical Service. Or call Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents transcribed... The Great Train Robbery, starring Mr. Fred McMurray, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. My name is Walter Beaumont. I'm 42 years old. I have no prominent marks or features that would distinguish me from any other plain, ordinary citizen. I live with my wife, Bess, in Oakland. If you saw me walking down the street, you wouldn't give me a second glance. The details of my appearance are very important. You see, they're what convinced me that I could execute a great train robbery. Bess and I have been married for 16 long and uneventful years. The year before we were married, I went to work for a toy manufacturing firm. I've been down there ever since and am now making $62 a week. 16 years ago, I had a lot of dreams and some ambitions. But the necessities and responsibilities of our everyday living have cost me most of those dreams and and what little ambition I had. Walter, did you remember to pay the rent? Yes, Bess. Installment on the washing machine? Uh Uh-huh. What about the payment on the car and the box spring and mattress? Those two, Bess. Oh, I wish we had a little money left over. At least enough to buy you a new white shirt. I've already turned the collars on the only three you own. Well, maybe we can get you one next month. If we're lucky. If we're lucky. For 16 years, it's been the same thing, over and over again. A new white shirt, if we're lucky. A new pair of hose, if we're lucky. The same thing, it never changes. Each night at 5.30, I drive up and park in front of a tarnished white stucco house where we've lived for the last eight years, and I know that nothing has changed. But tonight when I got home, there was a change. A happy change. Some relief. A new face. The face of a visiting long-lost relative, Cousin Eugene. Uh Uh-huh. Yes, sirree, Cousin Bess, that's just about the best meal I've had in a long, long time. Well, I'm glad you like it, Eugene. One of these days we'll have you over for a real feast, Eugene. As soon as Walter's ship comes in. Oh, I'm a plain man. The simple things in life are good enough for me. Not for Walter. He's got ideas high and mighty. No. No, not anymore. He's got a dream world all his own. Well, Cousin Bess, we all do a little dreaming now and then. A cigar, Cousin Walter? Oh, yes, thanks. Thanks, Eugene. Here's a a light. Mmm, that that tastes good. Yeah, there's nothing like a cigar after dinner, say I. It's the finishing touch. Do you uh, have any definite plans for the future, Eugene? Well, Walter, I think I'm just about ready to settle down. Well, that's good to hear. I'd like to buy me a farm somewhere and maybe raise some chickens. <laughs> Always did like chickens. Hmm. You know, I, I think I would have done something like that one day if... if. Go ahead, Walter. Say it. If you'd ever had the money. <laughs> well, that's my problem, folks. Money. 
You gotta have money to buy a farm, and right now I don't have any. Well, that, that's a shame. Say, speaking of money, you ever been up to Reno, Nevada, Walter? No, no, I've never been there. Ah, uh, we don't get to go to too many places, Eugene. Seems like we always have something else more important to do with Walter's vacation money. Mm. Well, you've never seen so much money in all your life as there is in Reno. I'll bet it's an exciting town, all right? Oh, oh, it is. Just about one of the most exciting towns I've ever been in. Yes, sir. Lots of excitement. Mm. Lots of money. I guess our type of people would never get up to a city like Reno. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Cousin Walter. They get all types of people up in a city like Reno. All types. You see, people figure there's money to be had there, and money attracts all kinds of people. <laughs> I often wondered what Walter'd do if he had a lot of money. <laughs> He'd be an interesting man to watch. Him and all his dreams. Yeah, they have all types up there. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. Uh, what did you say, Eugene? I said rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. Yeah. Yes, that's what I thought you said. And then Cousin Eugene gave me one of those long, lingering, meaningful looks. Then he leaned back in his chair, smiled, inhaled deeply on his cigar, blew the smoke out in a thin stream and washed it as it fanned up toward the ceiling. Eugene had made some kind of a decision, and it concerned me. It concerned me very much. The following morning, about 11.30, Eugene called me at the office. He told me he wanted to see me on my lunch hour. He said he had something very important that he wanted to talk over with me, and could I meet him? I met him at five minutes after 12 in front of the ferry terminal. It's not too long a ferry boat ride over to Richmond, and I figured I could be back to work on time. I'll just eat my lunch while you go ahead and talk, Eugene. Is that all right? Oh, oh sure. Sure, go right ahead, Cousin Walter. Yeah. Best fix your lunch every day? Oh, yeah, every day. As far back as I can remember. You'd be surprised how much money it saves. Mm-hmm. Walter, what would you do if I gave you one half of, say, uh, $25,000? Excuse me, I... For a minute, I thought you said $25,000. I did? What are you talking about, Eugene? Well, you're a dreamer, so am I. There's only one way to make our dreams come true. We have to buy them, Cousin Walter, with money. That's why I've picked you. Pick me? Uh, last night at the dinner table, I said there was a lot of money in Reno, Nevada. That's right, you did. Now, some of this money stays in Reno, and some of it goes elsewhere. Do you follow me? No, not quite. Well, some of it goes to banks, like banks here in Oakland and San Francisco. Oh, I, I see what you mean. Uh, now, how does it get to these banks? Well, some of it they drive, some of it they fly, and some of it they load on the mail car of a train. You follow me? Go ahead, Eugene. Go ahead. The train they loaded on leaves the city of Reno every Thursday morning at 11 o'clock. It arrives in San Francisco at 4.30 in the afternoon. Do you follow me now? Yes, yes. After the train leaves Reno, it passes through a place called Soda Springs at 10 minutes to 1. Then there follows a stretch of about 20 minutes before it passes a place called Dutch Flat, a stretch of nothing but lonely, dry desert. Go on, Eugene. And Go on. if one gentleman was to get on the train in Reno and another gentleman was to drive a car to a deserted junction in between Soda Springs and Dutch Flat... The train could be stopped, the money taken off, and, and the gentlemen well on their way before the authorities could be warned. Huh? <laughs> Why, Cousin Walter, do you realize what you've just suggested? Yes. Yes, Eugene, I... I've just suggested that we rob a train. The ferry boat pulled into the Richmond landing and Eugene got off. As he stepped down the gangplank, he turned around, smiled, and waved at me and disappeared into the crowd. The following day at work, I had a hard time trying to concentrate on a new shipment of toy atomic tanks we'd gotten in. And right after lunch, the phone on my desk began to ring. I let it ring a couple of times. I, I was almost afraid to pick it up. Afraid that it might not be Eugene. Hello? Hello, uh, Cousin Walter? Yes. Uh, done much thinking about that matter we discussed? Yes, yes, I have. I... But, Eugene, I was thinking, how can just the two of oh, us... Oh, it's very simple. I've worked for weeks on this plan. You must have complete 
faith in me. Oh, I do, Eugene, I do. But, but what about Bess? How, how will I explain it to her? Oh, now, you just leave that to me. Yes, but eventually I'm going to... Eventually, you can tell her. And, uh, Cousin Walter... Yes? What's more, but... I know she'll understand. So it begins. It's the kind of a thrill that comes once in a lifetime. When I was just a small boy, I had play-acted it out many times, but now it was a reality. I was going to rob a train of an estimated $25,000. We decided on a date. The robbery would take place two weeks from the following Thursday. That would give us ample time to prepare everything. And every day on my lunch hour, we would go over our plans, step by step. Now, the baggage car is in between the regular car and the mail car. There are two guards in the mail car, one man in the baggage car. Now, once we get past the man in the baggage car, our problem is solved. But timing is the most important thing, Cousin Walter. Absolutely. I realize that, Eugene. It, it must be timed to the split second. As you see, it takes ten minutes to get to the junction where the man in the automobile should be waiting. Ten minutes, right. The emergency cord should be pulled about 30 seconds before the junction is reached. No sense to upset the passengers. Uh-huh. Now, um, what about your job, Cousin Walter? Will they let you take a week off? Oh, I'm sure they will. Sure, they'll let, they'll let me off. But I'm still worried about Bess, Eugene. Oh, oh. Now, don't you worry about her. I'll talk to Bess. You just leave her to me. I'll talk to her. And he did. He wove Bess around his fingers as if she'd been putty. By the time he was through with her, she was begging me to take a week off and go somewhere. We'll find the money to pay for the trip somewhere, she said. But when Eugene suggested he'd finance the trip, that was the clincher. He told Bess he was going to take me up to the Hillary Lodge at Lake Tahoe for some fishing. Only he didn't finance the trip I did. With the $178 I drew out of our savings account at the bank. We needed money for our hotel room in Reno, the train ticket we had to buy, and for the gun we needed. The rest of the week went fast. And then it was Friday night and we were ready to leave. Eugene was waiting out in my car while I was finishing packing. Oh, Walter. Now, look, Bess, it's only for a week. I know, I know, but... Well, here, Walter. Here are your other two shirts. You want to look nice and neat. Here, put them in the suitcase. Fine, fine. There. Well, I, I guess I'm all set. I'd better hurry. Walter, you, you will take care of yourself. Oh, of course I will, Bess. Now, don't you worry. I'll be all right. Well, all set, Eugene. Oh, good. Oh, Eugene. Yes, Cousin Bess? You take care of my Walter. Where'd you say you were staying? At uh, the Hillary Lodge. It's near the lake. Oh, Oh, Walter. Now, look, Bess. If I don't write, please don't get worried. Promise me? Yes. Yes, I, I promise. Well, goodbye, dear. Goodbye, Walter. Jean, take care. And have a good time. Bye. Well, we're on our way, Eugene. Yep. You know, the next time I drive down this street, I'll be a rich man. Uh, yep. People like Bess are wrong, Eugene. Wrong? Yeah. Who says dreams don't come true? Autolite is bringing you Mr. Fred McMurray in The Great Train Robbery. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. <laughs> Say, uh, Hap, uh, talking about the first two-unit, six-volt automotive electrical system used as original equipment... Talking about what? Why, about the forerunner of today's modern and precision-made automotive electrical system. Oh. Why, everyone knows Autolite engineers developed it 42 years ago. Well, let's talk about baseball, Harlow. The season's underway. Just like players on a winning ball team, every unit of the Autolite electrical system has to work with every other unit of the system to give you the smooth economical performance you just normally expect from a car. That goes for the coil, distributor, starting motor, generator, battery, spark plugs, voltage regulator, and their thousands of component parts. Now you're talking about teamwork, eh, Harlow? I sure am, Hap, because every unit of the Autolite electrical system is related by Autolite engineering design and manufacturing skill 
to give you the smoothest performance money can buy. So when your Autolite-equipped car needs replacements, insist on the best, Autolite original service part. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Fred McMurray in Elliot Lewis's production of The Great Train Robbery, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Cousin Eugene and I arrived in Reno, Nevada late Friday night. When we got to Reno, we registered in one of the nicer hotels and stayed there for most of the following three days, just going out for our meals. On Monday, we left Reno for a short while and drove to the junction about 13 miles from Soda Springs. Eugene pointed out all the landmarks. This was where the train was to be stopped by pulling the emergency cord. Then on Tuesday, we went down to the train station and bought a ticket for the train leaving Thursday morning. On the way back to our hotel, we stopped in at one of the gambling casinos on the main street and Eugene started putting nickels in the slot machine. Hey, Eugene, I surely hope you don't throw away your share of the money on things like this. No need to worry about that, Cousin Walter. I'm for chickens. <laughs> well, day after tomorrow is the day. Yeah, day after tomorrow. How do you uh, feel, Cousin Walter? Well, excited. I don't know how to thank you, Eugene. Oh, now there's no need for that. And you're to be commended, too. Your plan is foolproof. Of course, I, I've never handled a gun before, but don't worry about that. Uh, did you say gun, Cousin Walter? Well, yes. Oh, I'm afraid you won't be handling the gun. I will. Well, you'll be driving the car. You, you won't have need for a gun, Eugene. But the positions are just reversed. I'll be on the train and you'll be in the car. Me in the car? Oh, I'm sorry, Cousin Walter. Wait a minute. You, Eugene, you've missed the most important part of our plan. Huh? This could very well cause it to fail. Well, what are you talking about? Identification. Our description. Eugene, look at me. What? Look at me. All right, now now describe me. Well, I... Uh, Go ahead, describe me. Look at me and describe me. Well? Go ahead. Well, you, you've got sandy hair. That's right. And so have two million other men. Go ahead. And, uh... And? Well, you're, you're just sort of plain-looking. Exactly, Eugene. Exactly. Plain-looking. Now, don't you see? When the guards on the train try to describe me to the authorities, they'll, they'll have a very difficult time. I certainly have no prominent marks or features to single me out from well, from any other plain, sandy-haired man of 42 years, have I? You know, Cousin Walter, I believe you've brought up a very important point. Thank you, Eugene. So, I'll handle the gun and you'll drive the car. Well, you you, you don't think for one minute... That uh... you're a coward? No, no, of course not. Wait a minute, Eugene. Let me pull the lever this time. Oh, all right. What? Well... What do you know about that? <laughs> you see, Cousin Eugene, we hit the jackpot. Our luck's already begun. <laughs> we had dinner before we went back to the hotel. When we got back, Cousin Eugene drew out a diagram and we went over the plans again. All I was to take from the mail car was one money bag. Eugene figured that each bag ought to contain about $25,000. And with one half of that, he figured he could start a pretty good-sized chicken farm. It was close to nine o'clock when Eugene shook me awake. This was the day. My heart was already starting to beat faster. I took a shower and shaved and got dressed. I put on my last clean white shirt. At breakfast, we went over our plan for the final time. Then we checked out of our hotel, put the bags in the car, and drove down to the station. Uh, don't forget to put the money in your suitcase, Cousin Walter. Yes. Are you, uh, are you nervous? Yeah, a little. Don't fire the gun, whatever you do. We don't want anyone to get hurt. Yes, yes, I understand. Good. Now, remember, you've only got ten minutes to get back to the mail car and get the money. Ten uh, minutes, that isn't very long. Be sure and keep your eye on your watch. I will. Keep my eye on my watch. <laughs> Well, well it's, it's time. Yes, it's time. Yes. I'd, uh, I'd better get on. Well, good luck, Cousin Walter. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you. This 
was it. I found my seat and sat down. I, I was lucky. The seat was in the first car after the baggage car. I wouldn't have far to go. I could feel the perspiration running down my back. I, I was ruining my last clean white shirt. The 50 minutes before we got to Soda Springs seemed like 50 hours. Then we reached Soda Springs and the train slowed down. There were no passengers at the station, so the train didn't stop. It, it just slowed down. And then we were on our way again. My ten minutes had begun. I made my way up to the baggage car, carrying the suitcase. The baggage man was reading a newspaper. Yes, sir? What can I do for you? I'd, uh, I'd like to check this suitcase. Ah, oh, forgot to at the station, huh? All right, hand it over here. I'll give you a baggage check. Uh, thank you. Uh... Hmm. Feels empty. You sure you wanted it? I'd appreciate it if you'd put your hands up. What is this? In simple language, a train robbery. Now, let's just start walking that way. That's the mail car, mister. I know. Hey, now look. Now, just do as I tell you and no one will get hurt. Walk in front of me. Now, knock and yell for the guards to open the door to the mail car. They won't open it for me. Oh, yes, I think they will. Now, knock. Okay, mister, it's your funeral. Hey, Red, open up. It's Harold. What do you want, Harold? There's nothing Pardon me, but uh, would you put up your hands? What are you talking about? You'll force me to shoot this man. I wouldn't want to do that. What is this? A train robbery. Now, I'd appreciate it very much if you gentlemen would back up against that wall. That's it. Thank you. I'll just remove these guns from your holsters. I just like bloodshed. And I'm afraid you gentlemen might be tempted. There we are. Now, let's see. Oh, yeah. Here they are. You're making a big mistake, mister. <laughs> you sound just like my wife. Now, let's see. Cousin said take just one bag. Now, there's so many. I, I think I'll take two. One apiece. I might as well. One. Two. How do you expect to get off the train, mister? The emergency cord will take care of that. Now, I have one more favor to ask of you, sir. Kindly open this side door of the car. He's going to jump. He's crazy. No, 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 not just yet. We have about 30 seconds to go. Now, the door, please. Open it. Fifteen seconds. Ten seconds. Five. Four. Three. Two, one. Now! All right, now remain standing in that corner, both of you. possibly read our license numbers from this distance. Doesn't matter. I've got them covered up. Well, how'd it go? Ah, perfect, Eugene. Perfect. I will admit I had a few bad moments, I guess, but otherwise it was perfect. Look. Look under these dirty shirts. What? Well, you took two bags, but I told you only to take one. Yeah, I know, but I, I figured it'd be easier dividing it with two bags. <laughs> We didn't even bother to stop for any sort of refreshments. We drove straight through to Sacramento. When we got there, Eugene thought we ought to separate, and we did. I hated to see Eugene go. I had grown very fond of him in the short time we'd been in business together. But it was a separation that you might call a necessity. When I got back to Oakland, it was almost 4.30. A good time, I thought to myself. I'll have the whole weekend to rest up before I have to go back to work. The house looked the same as I drove up. Maybe now I'll have it painted, I thought to myself. There was a car parked in front of the house. It was probably another salesman. I took the suitcase with my share of the money in it from the back seat and walked up to the front door. I had a wonderful feeling inside. Why, Walter, 
Walter! Walter, dear! Hello, Bess. Oh, Walter, Walter, where have you been? Uh, where have I been? Why, well, Bess, you know very well You look I... a mess, Walter, but I'm so glad to see you, dear. Well, Bess, what's wrong? Oh, here, dear. Come on into the living room and sit down. But, Bess, I don't understand why you're acting so hysterical. I really, I don't. Here, Walter, put down your suitcase. Well, I... Bess, uh, who are these... Oh, these gentlemen are from the police station, yeah, Walter. Mr. Beaumont. <coughs> Mr. Beaumont. The, uh, the police station? Oh, Look, Bess, I uh, I think I'll go upstairs and get cleaned up a bit. Oh, there's plenty of time for that later. Well, Bess, I... Now, you just tell me where you've been. Yes, your wife has been worried about you. Oh, well, look, Bess, I couldn't... Yesterday, I read in the paper where two men had been drowned at Lake Tahoe. They didn't know who they were. When I tried calling the Hillary Lodge, they told me you and Eugene weren't even registered there. Oh, oh I see. And I just got worried sick, just worried sick. So I called the police station. Oh, Walter, put down that suitcase and tell us what happened. Well, uh, later, Bess, uh, later. Oh, look at you, Walter. Your clothes all wrinkled, dirty shirt. Oh, you look a mess. Well, Bess, I'm sorry you're worried about me like you did. Well, uh, I'm glad you're home. You won't be getting out of my sight again for a long time, I tell you that. Mrs. Beaumont, we're very happy that your husband arrived home safely. Oh, yes, I am too, officer. But look at the condition he's arrived in. Oh, I'll bet he doesn't even have a clean shirt for work Monday morning. Here, Walter, give me that suitcase. No, no, now, wait, Bess. Too no. Many. I'll just get your dirty shirts out of this suitcase and get them in the washer. Well, I guess you won't be needing us anymore, Mrs. Beaumont. Bess, please. Please, Bess, don't open the suitcase. Bess, please. Suspense, presented by Autolite, tonight's star, Mr. Fred McMurray. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. They are members of the Autolite family, as well as are the 98,000 Autolite distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Our family also includes the nearly 30,000 men and women in 28 great Autolite plants from coast to coast and Autolite plants in many foreign countries, as well as the 18,000 people who have invested a portion of their savings in Autolite. Every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. So remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, the story about a man who committed a murder and got away with it for quite a while. The story is called Public Defender. Our star, Mr. Robert Ryan. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced by Elliot Lewis and was directed tonight by Norman MacDonald. Music was composed by Lucian Morwick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Portions of the program were transcribed. The Great Train Robbery was written for suspense by Richard George Pettuccini. In tonight's story, Joseph Kearns was heard as Eugene. Featured in the cast were Paula Winslow, Jerry Hausner, and High Aberbank. Fred McMurray may soon be seen in the Republic picture, Fair Wind to Java. And remember next week, Mr. Robert Ryan in Public Defender. Buy Autolite electrical parts, Autolite stay-full batteries, and Autolite resistor or standard type spark plugs at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. We thank the readers of Radio and TV Mirror Magazine for again voting Suspense, their favorite radio mystery program. You may read about the award in Radio and TV Mirror, now on the newsstand. This is the CBS Radio Network.